This is the story of one man's fight for human rights at the time of the American Civil War. Our film documents his rise from slavery to international acclaim and then his tragic decline into sickness and addiction. In 1863, hundreds of people gathered in Smarden to hear a Baptist minister speak. His oratory was spellbinding and his message was uncompromising. Britain must support the North in its fight against the Confederate States and slavery. The preacher that day was John Seller Martin, one of a number of black Americans who escaped from slavery and came to Britain to seek support and funding for the abolitionist cause. Perhaps the most famous of these was Frederick Douglass, who toured Europe for two years and was the first black American to hold government office. However, it was said of Martin that no other American, black or white, did more than him at this time. This is his story. By the 1860s, slavery had been abolished in Britain, its colonies and in many of the northern states of America. However, at the outset of the American Civil War, Britain adopted a position of neutrality, much to the anger of northern politicians. President Lincoln's declared aim at this time was just the preservation of the Union, not the abolition of slavery. But some in Britain saw a north-south division of America as being advantageous to its global interests. At the centre of the American-British relationship was the cotton trade, where 80% of Britain's imports came from the southern Confederate states. The industry employed nearly half a million people in England, at over 2,600 mills. Britain's cotton exports were valued at £32 million a year, which is about £13 billion today. In addition, Britain was building warships for the Confederate States. This is the Laird Yard, which built the sloop Alabama, which sank over 55 enemy merchant ships. Britain tried to avoid accusations that it was arming the southern states by installing the guns and crews at French ports after the vessels had been launched by British shipbuilders. In Britain, the American Civil War had implications for democracy as well, which for some British politicians had gone far enough with its 1832 electoral reforms. The declaration by the Confederate States that they would leave the Union strengthened feeling in Britain that the Civil War would weaken the United States. The two countries nearly came to war when a British ship carrying two Confederate diplomats was intercepted and captured by a northern warship. But after several weeks of high tension, the men were released and allowed to continue on to Britain, where they urged the government to recognise the independence of the Confederate States. There was also a narrative outside America that the conditions to which slaves were subjected was perhaps not so bad. And among British intellectuals, men such as Thomas Carlyle Ruskin and Charles Dickens showed a degree of sympathy towards the existence of slavery. However, as the Civil War went on, Britain moved away from its original position of neutrality to one of support for the Northern Union. John Seller Martin was born in North Carolina in 1832. His father was the nephew of the slave owner and for a time Martin lived together with his mother Winnie and sister Caroline. But eventually the family was sent south to a slave auction. That journey on foot took seven weeks, chained together with about 30 other slaves in what they called a coffle. Young men at the front unmarried women in the middle and mothers with babes at the rear. At the auction the family was split up when each was sold to different owners. The young Martin was occasionally able to play marbles with local white boys and he would persuade them to teach him how to read 
when he won. One day he received news that his mother was working on a plantation 60 miles away. He ran off and found his mother, whom he tried to persuade to escape with him. She told him she had tried on three occasions to escape and had been so badly beaten that her spirit was crushed and her body worn down by labour and lash. Before long Martin's whereabouts was discovered and he was jailed for seven months. During this time a friendly prison warder taught him grammar, history and maths. Over the next few years he was bought and sold eight times, but whilst he was working aboard Mississippi steamboats he learned about the Underground Railroad. This was a series of escape routes across America into the free states and Canada where slavery had been abolished. Over 100,000 slaves found their way to freedom. Martin stayed at one safe house for six weeks on his way north and the owner, a Reverend Milligan, wrote many years later that he was the smartest man he ever did meet. With forged papers Martin secured his freedom and in 1859 we find him in Boston, married to Sarah, where he had become a minister in the Baptist Church and a vigorous champion of the abolitionist movement. His passionate speeches earned him the title of the Lion from the West. For a time he supported the policy of the American Colonization Society, who wished to repatriate black Americans to Africa. He later withdrew his support when it became clear that the project would fail. Nevertheless, about 13,000 ex-slaves went to Liberia, where its capital, Monrovia, is named after James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. Martin then came to England, where he was helped by Harper Twelve Trees, a wealthy industrialist who employed nearly 500 people at his chemical factories in East London. Twelve Trees took great care of his people by providing welfare, libraries, meeting halls and musical entertainments. He was also an influential member of the Baptist movement and later paid off the debt owed for the building of Smarden's new Baptist church in the street. Although Martin was in poor health, he embarked upon a series of speaking and fundraising tours which took him as far north as Glasgow, Dundee and to Smarden and Sissinghurst in Kent. Martin raised a considerable sum of money for the abolitionist movement, but at the instigation of the Reverend John Kerwin, he was persuaded to use some of these funds to purchase the freedom of his sister Caroline. So he returned to America and bought her out of slavery. But this action, followed by allegations that he was leading a luxurious lifestyle, brought him into conflict with his superiors in the American Missionary Association. By now the Confederate States were being blockaded and exports of cotton to Britain dried up, leading to hardship and famine among the mill workers in the north of England. A relief fund was established raising by public subscription the equivalent of £40 million in today's money. Yet despite their plight, 
the cotton workers continued to express their steadfast support for the North and abolition. So much so that after the war, President Lincoln wrote an open letter of thanks on behalf of America to the people of these stricken cotton communities in England. By 1863, Martin was back again in England, where public opinion had swung behind the North. This is how Martin described British standpoints according to class. But there was debate about the wisdom of freeing four million slaves overnight, as opposed to a gradual process, and this is how Martin described it. And he was also fearful that unemployment would drive thousands of freed slaves to the northern states, which would lead to social unrest. Unfortunately, by now Martin had lost the confidence of his employers. He was sick, probably addicted to opiates, and embittered over allegations of excessive spending and poor business acumen. By 1866, his efforts at raising funds had dwindled dramatically, and his critics claimed that he had only received a thousand dollars in donations over a nine-month period. In desperation, he applied to the trustees of the Lancashire Cotton Famine Relief Fund for money, but was refused, and eventually he was forced to return to America. His departure was marked by public farewells from leading human rights campaigners, including J. S. Mill, Bright and Cobden. We next hear of him in Washington, fighting to have his fair-skinned nine-year-old daughter accepted at school after the authorities there discovered she came from a black family. In 1870, his old friend Frederick Douglass launched the first national newspaper of black Americans and made Martin its editor. However, presumably due to his failing health, he left and headed south to New Orleans, where he obtained the position of postmaster. By now, it seems he was a broken man. In 1876, his tragic life was ended, either by an overdose or suicide. His obituary in the New York Times was well worded. For the good he has done, and that was in him, he is mourned by his friends, and he was bad only to himself. <laughs>